All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? We're going to get started here in just a sec. I'll, I'm going to let this run for uh, a moment until we get some more folks in here. Sorry, I'd started this live stream kind of earlier, um, but I realized that I need to do this live stream through Google Chrome just because it works better. And I started on Firefox and then I ended it and then I came over to Chrome. At any rate, freedom for all, what's going on? Hey, I, you know, one thing that I'm actually really looking forward to in this is getting to know people who attend this live stream regularly and, you know, chatting and being like, oh, yeah, hey, yeah, what's going on, man? How's your mom doing? How's the family? How are the kids? Good morning to everyone uh, trickling in here. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Let me bring this up here. Uh, get started with some dispatch uh, stuff. Well, yeah, thanks. You know, I was wearing that uh, Haley Strategic. <laughs> I was wearing that Haley Strategic hat for a while, and then I said, oh, you know, I, I will uh, wear the hat of my friends over at Fieldcraft Survival. And by the way, Fox Company, we're still working on sourcing uh, hats, and basically we're going to do kind of a full – a full line of uh, gray zone gear and also a line of Fox company gear just for Fox company members. Brian. Great. Hey, glad to do this. I, I really enjoy this. Thanks for being here. Um, Sarah asks, would gray zone be beneficial to students studying strategic security? Hmm. Um, you know, you probably can't see it, but like right here, it are a couple of books that I need to crack open. Um, one's called the Strategic Analysis Cycle. One is the, a tool book, and one's a handbook. And I have not. The short answer is, um, it's probably not great because most of our stuff in Fox Company is tactical, basically disaster intelligence, and we really don't cover a lot of strategic stuff. However, the same process is right. If you're if you want to learn the intelligence cycle, because the intelligence cycle cycle applies to strategic, operational, and tactical levels, um, it may be uh, maybe beneficial for that. But most of our stuff, most of the stuff is tactical. It's geared towards emergency preparedness and community security, and you know, humanitarian aid or disaster relief type of missions. The stuff that I'm really involved in doing. All right. Ethan, welcome to the live chat. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off in Georgia this morning because one of the trends I've talked about in, in the early warning reports for the past couple of years now is increased political and social activism by corporations. And this even goes far beyond just the woke stuff. This goes into corporations weighing into political matters. And, you know, I I think that's happened off and on for a long time, um, you know, probably decades, probably as far as uh, U.S. corporations have been around, they have engaged in some level of politic. Uh, however, we have definitely turned a page uh, in the past, probably the past uh, decade or so. Um, there's a group of 70 black executives, so C-suite executives of corporations, current or former, who signed a letter against Georgia's voter ID laws. And they say that these laws are designed to limit uh, black people from voting. Signers say that they're concerned that these laws are going to proliferate. If the law in Georgia, if the voter ID laws in Georgia are not stopped, and one of the biggest things about this law in Georgia is it requires uh, basically proof of identity for uh, mailing in a, an absentee ballot. And they say Georgia law is not overturned. We're going to see more voter ID laws across the country. That's one reason why they're obviously challenging this law in uh, the courts in Georgia, or they soon will be. Um, also, some activists are calling for a boycott of Delta and Coca-Cola. Basically, they say 
Uh, both of those are headquartered in Atlanta, by the way. Basically, they say, hey, look, these massive Georgia corporations have not done enough. They haven't pushed back. And, and I mean, just a few moments after I wrote that sentence this morning, I saw where now the Delta CEO has come out and uh, and opposed these this Georgia voter ID law. And one, if you live in Georgia, well, actually, if you live in, in anywhere that might have a voter ID law, um, just, you know, you remember how was it I don't know, a couple of years ago, there were some Hollywood movie producers basically saying, well, we're not going to film anything in Hollywood or we're not going to film anything in Georgia if I forget what it was, but if X, Y, or Z happens. And so I'm not, I don't think Delta and Coca-Cola will pull out of, you know, Atlanta, especially because uh, Georgia is going to be a deeper blue in the future. But in some states that do remain red, you know, it just in terms of corporate activism, uh, corporate political and social activism, um, I mean, it's within the realm of possibility that we could see uh, some corporations relocate, just like they're moving from California for economic and financial reasons. Maybe they leave red states in the future because of voter ID laws and, you know, these uh, other regulations that they say are unfair and they don't support democracy. I think we're probably at peak democracy, by the way. Yeah, and hey, by the way, um, thanks. I hear this every so often. Why does this channel only have so few subs? Probably because I haven't posted to it regularly. I mean, there have been months where I have done nothing on this channel. Um, that is, oh, the, yeah, it was the abortion law in Georgia. In Georgia. Yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, if you hit the thumbs up button, and also if you're not a subscriber and you want to subscribe, um, I am going to do this. I think I'm just going to go ahead and do uh, a daily show and really try to expand it. Maybe um, do these from the office instead of my home office and uh, maybe have a little bit higher production value. At any rate, we're going to move on. Uh, these shortages are going to continue to happen. I was looking at some um, freight data this morning, and ocean freight companies are continuing to warn that international trade is going to remain disjointed until June. At the earliest, as these companies work out the backlog, obviously uh, these shipping lanes got backed up during the Suez Canal blockage. I saw someone somewhere the other day they called that a, a de denial of Suez attack. Um, and also, we have we're also seeing a uh, still a massive backlog of ships at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Those are the uh, the United States' two largest ports in terms of volume. And, you know, that's nothing new. That's been backed up, backing up since last year. I've talked about it. I've talked about it a lot last year, actually. Um, here's one new thing, however, uh, looking at this uh, logistics and freight data this morning, uh, there are logistics firms and shipping firms talking about driver shortages. The van load to truck ratio is up over 300% year over year compared to February, which is not incredibly surprising given the near standstill that we had on for a lot of these um, for a lot of uh, shipping last year. Um, but one thing is interesting. Uh, the van load to truck ratio is up 76% from last month. So from February. So we are seeing a massive boom in shipping right now. In short, what this means is that demand for shipping outweighs the supply of shipping, both in terms of freight and uh, container ships you know, there's been a massive shortage for the United States and Europe, massive shortage of empty container ships. I've talked about this before because basically China is outbidding everyone. They say, we're trying to get our economy back up and running and we got a lot of stuff to export. And so they are outbidding European and, and American firms for these empty container ships. And so a lot of places, actually Europe's having a massive problem with this right now. They can't get any any empty container ships because China is outbidding and uh, buying them all basically. So um, I, another thing I was looking at Morgan Stanley uh, trucking survey this morning. And one of the respondents said that 2021 is going to have the largest demand ratios in history. And just to recap, there are people talking about uh, driver shortages, truck shortages in the United States. So even when stuff does get into the port of Los Angeles or Long Beach, Rates for shipping, domestic transportation are rising. 
let me look through the uh, comments on here. Yeah, and and yeah, that's a good point. Consumer prices on almost everything are rising rapidly. So yeah, um, well, I mean, I can't talk to. I I don't think everything is rising rapidly. However, we certainly are seeing uh, price increases, and that's both due to push and pull inflation. We're going to see. I think we're going to see much higher inflation. And I talked about this yesterday. The different. The difference between CPI and PCE, consumer price index, and uh, personal consumption expenditures, those are the two ways that most economists measure inflation. And then there's real inflation. And so CPI and PCE are not really the best ways to measure inflation, but real inflation is going to be much higher than the actual, the official rate of inflation. And also, let me talk about this too. One reason why we are going to see much higher inflation this summer, maybe. 3%, 4%. 3%, 4%. Guys like Jeff Gunlock have said, you know, up to 4% is, uh, he says 3% is certain. But we went through a disinflationary period last year. So already our year over year inflation, I think I may have talked about this yesterday. Year over year inflation is going to be much higher because we had disinflation. So inflation was much lower at, you know, spring, summer of last year. Um, and then let's move on to this uh, third item. I only have three items for you this morning, but we'll do some Q&A and maybe talk about some other stuff. Um, Chinese manufacturer Foxconn, uh, they follow Samsung. So about two weeks ago, Samsung came out and warned of imbalances in the supply of electronics components, not just semiconductors, which I've talked about on this show before, uh, but now Foxconn is talking about a shortage of integrated circuits. And integrated circuits are used for displays, so like laptop displays or cell phone displays, um, and also in battery power. Foxconn expects these shortages to last into 2022. So the picture that I'm getting from the shipping item that I just talked about, and now this electronic, this integrated circuit uh, component shortage, and there are other electronic shortages. Um, the picture that I'm getting is between delays in international shipping, the U.S. is going to continue to see decreased selection. So there's going to be decreased availability. Like I talked about, I went to Best Buy and Office Depot the other day looking for a printer, and most of their printers were out, and they didn't have a very deep selection. They maybe had like one or two printers on hand for the the models that they actually did have in stock. So decreased selection, lower volume, and higher prices for electronics. And uh, based on what we're seeing with international shipping delays and uh, and just congestion, um, in addition to these electronics components, it's probably going to last into next year. All right, so those are my major items for today. Uh, there is a, uh, in today's early warning report, by the way, if you want access to the full early warning report, you can go to subscribe. We do a daily email and and uh, also online report. And then you can also listen to the podcast. I've already recorded today's podcast. Uh, there is a new anti-ICE direct action, uh, at least a protest, if not a riot, planned for this weekend. Um, and then Max has a pretty good breakdown of some uh, anarchist literature, basically some propaganda that uh, kind of outlines their strategy for how they build an anarchist uh, revolution in the United States. And that is in today's full early warning report, which you can get at forwardobserver.com slash subscribe. All right, let's open up the floor to some questions now. Uh, Texas or Alaska, if you had to pick one to move from a blue state. Hmm. Okay. Well, the first thing we have to understand is Texas is turning blue. Uh, It probably will turn blue in the next couple of election cycles. So if you want to escape a blue state, uh, realize that you may be moving to a blue state if you move to Texas. It also, I think how you want to live your life is also an important factor in terms of Texas or Alaska. And by the way, Alaska has a, I mean, they have the rainy part of Alaska, then they have like the snowy tundra Arctic part of Alaska. So also, you know, kind of depends where you want to live. Just like Texas has, even on the same uh, the same latitudes, Texas has a variation of climates. East Texas is the southeast. It's humid. It's, uh, I think it's coniferous. And then, you you know, you move into central Texas where I live and, you know, you kind of get into um, 
you know, kind of the plains area. And then you get into West Texas, which is just straight desert. So frankly, it kind of depends on where you want to live and um, what, what climate you really enjoy. Um, also in Alaska, you know, we talk about higher prices. Prices are high in Alaska, just like Hawaii, right? It, it takes more money to get stuff up there. Uh, and I don't really know a lot about Alaska. I have been, and I would love to go back. Um, but those are just a few things I know. Those are some, some considerations I would make. Uh, and it also kind of depends on what scenario you're, you're moving for or planning for. If you're just trying to escape a blue state, I think there are probably better states than Texas or Alaska to go to. But, you know, if you, if you want to live off the grid and, uh, you know, remove yourself from the modern world, then, you know, it's easy to get lost in Alaska on some acreage up there. And, uh, man, I'll tell you, I have, I've thought about that, doing that myself. Um, let's see. Uh, will Texas be blue across the board? Or just through high density populations. Yeah, so Texas is going to become just like Oregon, just like California, where you're going to have cities that dominate state politics. Okay, so Los Angeles and the Bay Area dominate state politics for California, even though I believe most of the state, at least by county, is red. Texas, predominantly red geographic by geographic space, but a very dense, high, high density population centers, which are blue which will come to dominate state politics. So Texas won't be blue across the board. But, you know, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, even Fort Worth is turning blue. Like I was looking at some maps the other day. Now, Fort Worth has traditionally been more conservative uh, than the, the most conservative part of the, of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, but even, you know, and I've noticed this in Austin too, the blue areas continue to expand outward and like, we, which was surprising actually it shouldn't, shouldn't be one County North of uh, Travis County, which is where Austin is. And basically, you know, you have so many people moving into Austin and they don't like the congestion. They don't like all the things that they left California for. So now they're moving out to kind of like the suburbs and surrounding areas and turning those places blue as a result. Um, Al, uh, Axel says, I heard Wyoming is good. Yeah. You know, I used to live in Wyoming. I love Wyoming. Unfortunately, it's starting to have the same thing. You know, I, I spent a summer in Bozeman several years ago and people started calling it Bose Angeles because there's so many people from, from California moving to Bozeman and that's good. Look, that's going to continue to be the trend, right? People are mobile. They work online. They're doing remote working. They're going to be moving to these paradises, uh, basically. And I think parts of Wyoming are a paradise. I lived in Teton County. So uh, that was a really nice place to live. Uh, but I tell you, people, they're absolutely destroying these places, um, especially, and no offense to Californians. And I'm mainly talking about the liberals and progressives moving from California to these other states. But, you know, because they're environmentalists, they like to be out in nature and, uh, and so they're going to naturally gravitate towards these areas and drive up prices. Actually, home prices, uh, inv inventory on home prices I was looking at this morning have dropped to like multi-year lows. Home prices in general have risen, I want to say 15%. That may be year over year. So, um, you know, they are changing a lot of things. All right, let's see. Where is another question? Regional relocation versus state. I Appalachian, Ozark, Northern Rockies. Looking at uh, looking at what the regional weather such growing patterns and rural sentiment is versus state politics. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I don't know if that's a point or a question, but yeah, a lot of these states that are blue, a lot of these states that are red will vary depending on where you live.
All right, let's see here. You know, hey, I started reading this book the other day, and I don't know, whatever. It's called The Rosy Future of War. It was written back in the 1990s by this French guy, and it's interesting, but I think I'm going to stop reading it because um, I realize just how like outdated it is. And one of the reasons why I, I started reading that book from the 1990s is because reading through Unrestricted Warfare, it's very interesting. That book was written in 1999, and it's very interesting in – um, looking at their kind of forward projections of how they understand war from the 90s. And so I thought, oh, you know, let me grab this other book that was written in the 90s about the future of war and see, kind of compare, whoops, compare and contrast. I got my mic here and I just hit it with my hand. Compare and contrast these visions of, of future war. By the way, let me grab this real quick. I just spent a ton of money a few weeks ago at the government printing office and I bought a bunch of stuff, uh, like books and stuff. Um, but I tell you, you know, one reason why I named my new training company Gray Zone Activity is because I do believe the United States is going to become a gray zone in the future. And uh, we just haven't recognized that. Actually, man, that's this is a good point. I'm almost done with my – I have a new YouTube video coming out. I'm probably going to publish it on Monday. And it's about multi-domain conflict with China. And I, I'm not going to weigh too heavily into multi-domain battle other than to say it is China is going to attack the U.S. homeland. If we do get into uh, a war, a, a sh military shooting war with China, uh, they are virtually certain to disrupt homeland operations or homeland conditions. So that is what the, the video will pr predominantly be about. But I'll tell you, if you really want to stay ahead of the curve, on gray zone stuff. They're going to turn America into a gray zone. They're already in the process of doing that. And so basically I got on GPO and just basically did a search for gray zone and there's a regaining strategic initiative in the gray zone. I don't know. I spent several hundred dollars on buying a bunch of buying all their gray zone and, and not just gray zone, but low intensity conflict, basically anything that I had or anything that they had, um, also, A Books, ABE Books is a place where I buy a lot of um, older books on low intensity conflict and small wars, insurgency, counterinsurgency, so on and so forth. You know, guerrilla warfare, counter guerrilla warfare. And by the way, if you want the train, so my overall point is start reading about this stuff now because this is going to be much more important in the future. Understanding understanding the gray zone and understanding both the strategic and tactical principles of how the United States is going to change in the gray zone. And of course, if you want the intelligence training to navigate the gray zone, uh, head over to um, gray zone activity, www.grayzoneactivity.com sign up for Fox company it is my kind of private online training group. And yesterday I, or Monday, I published a warning order. For the Derek Chauvin trial, we're going to be battle tracking the Minneapolis riots. And also this week, I'm going to do a quick a couple of introductory videos and kind of set out a, a training plan to get everyone trained up in the next two weeks so that we can have some, uh, some remote intel folks. Basically, we'll all come together and we'll battle track and kind of keep up to date on the Derek Chauvin trial, produce real-time intelligence on the security situation there, and then also produce... Uh, probably daily intelligence summaries for people to consume. So if you want to cut your teeth on a real world mission, doing real world intelligence stuff, especially disaster slash, you know, kind of civilian community intelligence stuff, uh, definitely sign up for Fox company. You can find that at www.grayzoneactivity.com. All right, let's look for another question here. Do you have any thoughts on weather manipulation? Yeah, I mean, geoengineering is real. We know China is doing it. Uh, I I don't remember if I talked about this on the podcast or maybe this YouTube live stream the other day, but Taiwan is experiencing a drought, which is affecting their semiconductor production because it takes uh, lots of water to cool, lots of very clean water to cool uh, the semiconductors and involved in this and other components involved in the process of making these semiconductors. So Taiwan did not have uh, 
the monsoon rains that they typically do resulted in a drought. And one of my, this is just conjecture, speculation. I'm not saying that this is definitely the case, but you know, one of my thoughts was, uh, what if China is somehow manipulating the weather uh, against Taiwan? Now, look, uh, don't shoot the messenger. That is just a question because I'm a curious person. So, uh, in terms of weather manipulation, yeah, it happens. We know, and actually, in in uh, unrestricted warfare, this kind of manual slash book that these two Chinese army colonels wrote back in 1999, they actually talk about that. It's, uh, they talk about biotechnology, um, which is not weather manipulation, but they talk about a new concept of weapons. And basically, they say, "Look, you can weaponize anything. You can control the weather." Uh, you know, they're basically kind of imply like, "Oh, what if you could send a hurricane to another country?" And uh, you know, and that's basically a new weapon of war. It's a new method of warfare, kind of weather warfare, climate warfare. Uh, so, yeah, the Chinese have um, done done this uh, kind of stuff here. And I, I don't know, maybe the United States and other folks are doing it as well. Fragment record says, thanks for the recommendation of the sovereign individual, man. I really enjoyed the sovereign individual. It's a fantastic book. It's a really dense read. And, uh, there's a, just a lot of kind of mind bending stuff in there, especially the meta political stuff. Just for those of you who aren't familiar they're sovereign individuals also written back in the 1990s. And they talk about the metapolitical shifts that happen in the West every 500 years. They say roughly every 500 years, there's a new technological invention and you get a metapolitical shift. So we went from the age of anarchy and plunder to the age of feudalism, to the industrial age, and now to the information age. And they just talk about ways in which that, uh, that, Life in the West is going to change. And one of the most interesting things about that book is they say in the information age, basically the five, the 500 years from the year 2000 to the year 2500. And I know that's so far away. It's like I can't even wrap my brain around the year 2500. But they say the nation state is going away and we are going to kind of revert into city states and enclaves. And, you know, this just like we look at feudalism, it's like, oh, who? Um, and I don't mean to discount this, to discount neo-feudalism, which I think is also what we're heading into, um, but there will be free enclaves or free city-states, and there will probably be neo-feudal societies or you know neo-feudal enclaves as well. But you know, we look at the age of feudalism of having vassals and lieges and, and that stuff. We just think, man, that's so antiquated. That's, I mean, that's like ancient history practically. It's not really, but it kind of feels like that's how long long ago it was. And eventually, you know, your grandkids or great grandkids are going to look at, wow, you used to pay taxes to a nation state, like you used to pay taxes as a citizen there. Wow, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's loony. Who, who would do that? So it's a very interesting book. Um, and I do recommend that to anyone who's curious. Who is it? It's really more of kind of an intellectual book. If you're a, uh, man. Should Ford Observer slash Fox Company include a weekly state situational update separate from the early warning that is focused on key states? I'm just noticing the chat trends. Yeah, I talked about that a little bit yesterday. Basically, the future Ford Observer, we we can't do the intelligence for your community or for your county, but we can do it for the state and um, you know, or for a state or region. And that's something that I've talked about for a few years now. And we just, you know, I can't launch something like that, like. It'd be interesting to do a Pacific Northwest Intel brief, you know, or Southeast or Texas Intel brief or Mountain West Intel brief or Northwest Northwest or Midwest Intel brief or Mid-Atlantic. We can do that, but we haven't had the the volume of subscribers to to make that economically viable. Um, However, um, you know, if if enough people are interested, um, you know, that's something we can definitely do. You know, we have the tools. Here's the deal. We have the data aggregation and the tools and even some machine learning and AI tools to do that. Uh, so at any rate, you know, in, in the future, as we continue to go grow, we'll probably look at where most of our subscribers are and wherever they are will, will be the first regional Intel brief we start doing. And, and it'll probably be once a week just on, uh, 
Well, a lot like the early warning brief stuff that interests or concerns us, you know, these trends that we're seeing, uh, pieces of data that we can, that help us to extrapolate into the future, you know, what we think could happen. Um, what does battle tracking specifically mean? Sarah asks. Okay. Well, traditionally, like if you think about World War II, and they did this during the Civil War and lots of other wars, um, as a matter of fact, in ancient times, they probably did some form of battle tracking. Battle tracking is you have a map. Let's let's talk about like kind of a conventional war context. Actually, let's talk about the Gulf War, right? So battle tracking is, you know, you have a map and you are marking the, the last known or suspected locations of enemy units. And like when I was going through the schoolhouse in 2004, you know, one of the things we had to do was look at a map. And by the way, in 2004, we were still studying basically kind of a Soviet era adversary called Ariana. And basically, we'd have to look at a map and do some train analysis and say, okay, doctrinally, where are where would self-propelled artillery set up? Or, you know, where would we find these BMP3 fighting vehicles? Uh, where would we find mechanized infantry? Where would we, you know, where would we expect tanks to be? So on and so forth. And you would plot that on a, on a map. Or we were using a, this stupid thing called ASAS Light, and all I've done is taken that concept and applied it to riots. But it can be applied to forest fires, to you know maybe lots of natural disasters, anything where you can take raw data and put it on a map. I consider battle tracking, and I just use battle tracking because that's the you know we call it riot tracking or disaster tracking or whatever. And what we're doing is over time, as you're plotting things on this map. You're building a you're building a security picture of what the the overall area or the area of operations looks like, and so we can use that to make decisions. Like, okay, are we going to bug out from the Ferguson riots? We battle track the Ferguson riots. Actually, that was the very first thing that we ever battle tracked, and it really was a proof of concept. Yes, we can do this. We can visualize raw data. We can build a security picture based off of our intelligence gathering via open source imagery, human intelligence, uh, signals intelligence. We can take all this information in, figure out how to put it on a map, and then basically get a real-time or near real-time picture of what the security situation looks like. So that is battle tracking. All right, let me catch back up to... That's a great question. Um, and, you know, I should probably do a video, just basic video on battle tracking in general. Uh, coal miner's daughter, thanks for being here. I'm glad you catch this live. By the way, I really want to add production value to this and, you know, make it, you know, maybe do like a 30 minute, maybe an hour show every single day. Uh, who would China and Russia favor? Would it be the rebellious people or the government in power? I, I think any, any segment that I guess you're talking about in some American conflict, maybe. Axel, um, I think China and Russia both just, uh, I think they do want to topple American power and influence around the world. And one way that they're going to do that, one way that the United States is going to be turned into a gray zone is probably by uh, external support to various factions in the United States. I think probably in the over the next decade, if it's not already happening. Frankly, I think they they're going to support Okay, let's look about the let's look at this in Afghanistan, right? So you had Iran, who was building ties with the Taliban and also building ties with the Islamic Republic or what it, government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And basically, Iran was playing both sides, and they said, "We don't know if the Taliban's going to win or the Afghan government's going to win. You know, U.S. supported Afghan government's going to win. So you know, we're just going to kind of uh, develop ties with both sides so that we have relations for whoever ultimately." takes control over Afghanistan. And, you know, I think maybe, you know, at some point China will, will support whoever, uh, at least initially support whoever poses probably the greatest internal threat, or at least poses a, uh, is able to substantially disrupt conditions internally. And then, you know, maybe later on, maybe they develop ties, kind of official diplomatic ties with, uh, with, some of these groups. And I look, I don't know. I don't sit at the China desk and I don't read all day about China. Um, 
that's just those are maybe my initial thoughts. Uh, but I could tell you, both Russia and China, they just um, what's happening right now. This low intensity conflict that's going on inside the United States right now. They're loving it, loving it. Uh, Mitchell says, I live in Georgia. Do you see a Democrat winning the next governor election since they won the Senate? Atlanta is already becoming the next Hollywood. If they win, we will become the next California. Well, no offense, but I think Texas is probably becoming the next California. But I do sympathize with Georgia because my entire life, I grew up in the Southeast. My entire life, Georgia has been deep red. And it was, it, frankly, it was surprising. It shocked the heck out of me to see that Georgia went blue. Um, I don't know. I think these thing, these things tend to ebb and flow. Um, but you know, ultimately we are seeing a what might be called the great realignment politically, uh, where more and more more and more states in the southeast are going to turn blue. Especially, here's the deal. If Biden does, if the Biden administration does do this pathway to citizenship kind of thing, and they create 10 to 30, you know, they say, oh, you know. A lot of people say it's going to create 10 million new citizens. Well, through chain migration and these sponsorships and all this other stuff, it's not going to stop at 10 million. It's probably going to go up to 20 or 30 million. And so I look at states like uh, Florida, like Texas, North Carolina. They have more illegal populations than the margin of votes between Republicans and Democrats in statewide elections. And so uh, even if, you know, if a majority of of these people who do get a pathway to pathway to citizenship vote, and maybe they're not voting in the next election cycle or two. You know, maybe there's some kind of the, maybe the pathway is longer than than two or four years. Yeah, eventually uh, you're gonna have a lot of states like Florida, North Carolina, Texas flip uh, flip blue, and that may it may be a a generational thing. It may just be forever. I don't know. All right. Um, I don't know if they're going to have a Democrat governor. I'm not the best person to ask about that. All right. Looking at some more questions here. Adam, thanks for the support. Adam says he's going to sign up. I, I, I really appreciate the support. Um, and you know we work hard every day to pr produce produce the the best warning intelligence. Talking about stuff before it happens, stuff that you can get prepared for, uh, and then also on the Fox Company side, uh, building a training process. And you know what I tell students when I teach these tactical intelligence courses is there's there's not enough of guys like me, right? I mean, there's basically like that I can think of. There's like one dude training kind of civilian intelligence like disaster you know or intelligence for emergency preparedness and that's it and so really my goal is by doing these tactical intelligence courses and also by running fox company is to train a lot more people who are well versed and eventually skilled in intelligence so they can do this stuff locally for themselves so i thank you and i, I appreciate the support Let's see here. Can you touch on how we can counter the vaccine passport requirement? I haven't talked about this and I, um, I know they're developing this thing and, you know, of course I've seen it everywhere. You know, I mean, at some point, I think we're just going to have to say, look, this is a step too far, right? I mean, I'm not wearing a, I'm not putting a yellow star on my pat on a vaccine passport. Um, you know, and basically I've heard people try to say, look, you know, they're trying to build, uh, I've heard some people say that basically a caste system is forming. Like you have the vaccinated who can go anywhere they want and do things and have all these you know, privileges while if you don't have the vaccine, you have your privileges restricted. And, and, you know, that to me sounds like a, I mean, that's a reasonable expectation, I think. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, 
I don't know. I haven't given that a whole lot of thought other than if enough people don't sign up for it and publicly push back against it, it's less likely to happen. That doesn't mean it won't happen. Um, Adam uh, says, would you consider doing a post-virus update on your Civil War II video series? Um, yes. I do need to go back and update that Civil War II series, but a lot of that stuff's evergreen. A lot of that stuff's not going to change. Like the doctrinal stuff that I talk about in terms of low-intensity conflict, that doesn't change. But yeah, you know, I probably should go back and do maybe like a some kind of revised edition. It's just it's it's really time consuming to do that stuff, and I just don't have a ton of time to do it. Um, however, I got a new guy starting at Ford Observer next week, a new employee. So um, eventually, in probably like in two to four weeks, I'll have I'll have substantial amounts of extra time. So yeah, maybe I can do it later next month. Uh, do you see military members who decline the vaccine seeing related consequence? Um, yeah, yeah, there's, I don't know. I don't really know what's, what's happening in the military, um, in terms of the vaccine. At first it was voluntary. And then you start seeing these orders from these base commanders basically saying like, oh, you have to have the vaccine. You have to show proof of vaccine to enter the DFAC and all this stuff. So how voluntary is that? I guess, I don't know. GP says, this is my new favorite channel. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I really enjoy doing this, and um, I'm glad you're here. All right. Any other questions about anything? Otherwise, I'll be back. I'm going to, you know, like I said, I'm, I try to do these between 10 and 11. I try to do these live between 10 and 11 Central Time. Eventually, we will... We'll stick to a specific time. All right, 112, lots of other numbers, says the daily videos are great. Thank you. I, I'm really glad to do these. Ford or Chevy? I drive a Dodge, so neither Ford or Chevy. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you for the support. And uh, let's see, Boris says, if we like this kind of content, which service would be the most like these updates? Definitely the early warning report at forwardobserver.com. You can go to forwardobserver.com slash subscribe. And the situational awareness uh, briefs that I do on here is just the first part of the report. And um, and then basically the, your, the rest of the report you will get if you're a subscriber. And also I do the daily podcasts and talk about other things, especially low intensity conflict. We track what a lot like uh, what uh, leftist groups are doing, especially armed leftist groups and, you know, talk about how they're developing. And actually there's a pretty, um, it's really not that surprising, but it is significant. We are seeing significant developments in these armed far left groups. Chris says, I just signed up for the year. Looking forward to the information. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to producing the information. I tell you, one reason why I started Ford Observer is because I already do, I was already doing this stuff for myself. I was already thinking like, hey, I'm an Intel analyst and I'm interested in emergency preparedness and I'm gravely concerned about the future. Um, if I'm already doing this, looking at things, looking at trends, trying to figure out how to best strategically prepare for the future, um, you know, other people would probably be interested. And um, so that is, so I started Ford Observer. Uh, to share everything we learn and everything we're looking at. Can you recommend a book or two for us to help expedite Fox company learning? Yes. In 2015, I wrote a book. It's almost 200 pages long called SHTF Intelligence. And I'm in the process of trying to uh, update that book, which will basically be a second edition. And it is not published yet. And I don't know when it will be published. It's a massive undertaking. But if honestly, if you want a, if you want a uh, kind of an ex expedited, um, kind of a, an accelerated learning curve for Fox Company for intelligence stuff, just go back and watch my old videos. Uh, there's a, an entire series called "How an Intelligence Analyst Prepares for SHTF," and 
if you watch that video, you'll get a pretty good gist of other things that you're, you're going to learn in Fox Company. Uh, do you think John Mark was right about the stuff he tried pushing? No. No, I don't. Boris says, if you can't tell, I'm trying to be a subscriber, support your work. Well, Boris, thank you for the support. Uh, we wouldn't exist without folks like you. So I, I really appreciate it. And also, my employees appreciate it. Like the, the whole, We have a whole Ford Observer team that's involved in this. It's not just me. I couldn't do all this stuff by myself. Uh, Eric asks, how important is challenging the narrative? That's more of like a information operations thing. And here's the deal. When you're talking about national narrative, unless you have national level influence, you're probably not going to alter the national narrative. What I would rather do is look at my sphere of influence and say, okay, uh, what do these people believe? What are they consuming in the news that is incorrect or misinformation or disinformation designed to manipulate them? And now how can I push back on, you know, or how can I offer another narrative or co a competing narrative to maybe have them consider the alternative? And really, if you want to counter the narrative, uh, we put down the national stuff and just focus on your own network or your sphere of influence. I think that's probably the, the best way to counter the narrative, but yeah, it's incredibly, incredibly important. Colton says, seems the best thing to do is to network right now. It's been difficult to build networks, finding specialized people, et cetera, people you can trust. I'm not sure if we'll ever have. Oh, no. Okay. So, Yes, networking. I, I'm a big proponent. Go out and start a neighborhood watch. I talk about that frequently. Start a neighborhood watch because not only are you going to enlist the help and get to know your neighbors, um, you're also building a de facto information sharing network locally. Put aside this national stuff. It's my big problem with a lot of these, you know, conservative or you know right-wing organizations is they got a national leader and they got a regional leader and they got di district and state leaders and all this stuff. And they want to build this massive hierarchy, which is so stupid because the amount of time you waste trying to build a hierarchy is time that you are not spending on building horizontal ties. You know, we have vertical ties, which, which connect us to our local community. Super important. Actually, vertical ties are the most important thing you can be building right now, you know, your, your local networks and uh, man, they just, they want to build like a, a fortune 500 conservative group. And they're completely missing the point that without grassroots support, without community organizing, that's why the left is spanking the right right now. Cause they're way better at community organizing. So if the right really wants to win in this country, uh, they have to community organize. They have to build grassroots local organizations and stop messing around with all this national chapter BS because it's completely stupid. Not only that, one thing we've learned about these anarchist groups, right? So there's a concept in targeting or whatever counterinsurgency called leadership decapitation, right? That's what we try to do with bin Laden and Zawahiri and all these other guys, right? We said, look, if you cut the head off the snake, then you can internally fracture an insurgent group right? Because you take out the leader. Now, maybe you have these two guys now competing against each other and that group fractures along their loyalties, their, you know, their hierarchical loyalties. It's called leadership decapitation. You can't decapitate leadership of an anarchist group because there is no leadership. They do everything by consensus, like these affinity groups like Antifa and so on. There's no hierarchy. So, and that's deliberate. That's a deliberate way of organizing. And one one reason why I think a lot of these right wing or conservative movements have patriot movements have ended is because anything that's hierarchical, it's very easy. It's very, very easy for the FBI or some other organization to get in there and cause internecine fighting. Well, if we keep things local, right, um, then it's much it's much more difficult to do that kind of stuff because there's no you know, there's no big win. There's no head of the snake to cut off. And I don't know, maybe that's one reason why a lot of these patriot groups try to do hierarchy, hierarchical things because uh, 
I don't know, maybe there's some influence. If you build a hierarchy, you know, you can topple the top levels of the hierarchy and fracture the organization. All right. Uh, for a sidearm, Glock or SIG or other, like I think it's pretty difficult to argue against the Glock. That's what I carry. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm not a like I'm not a big gun guy, but one of the interesting things um, that I've done is you take a Glock 35, right, which is 40 caliber, and I'm not a big fan of 40 caliber, but you can actually buy a conversion barrel for Glock 35 to run 9 millimeter and 357 SIG. So really as a survival weapon, and I've learned this from the guys over at Bliss in Bryan, Texas. Um, Bliss is a, a gun shop. Very knowledgeable dudes over there. Um, basically, as a survival pistol, it's pretty good because there's a, a shortage on 9 millimeter. Well, you can switch to 40 or 357 SIG. You know, so, I mean, it doesn't help when there's an ammo shortage on everything, uh, but it does give you, you, you basically buy two extra barrels and you kind of have three guns in one, which is a very interesting concept. Um, so at any rate, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a Glock guy. What's one thing people forget to put in their area studies in your experience? Hmm. Probably the, the people. I think the human terrain is one of the most important aspects of your area study, understanding your neighbors and your community and, you know, various, uh, right. Okay. You think about a human, like an iceberg, right? There's the 10% that you can see, you know, kind of skin color, clothing, lifestyle choices. And then there's 90% that's, that's subsurface, you know, culture and values and, you know, mores, social mores. And, you know, I, I think probably in the area study, one reason to do an area study specifically to look at the human terrain is to find people in your neighborhood that are likely to cooperate with you during a disaster or an emergency. And I want to identify those people. And I want to meet them as soon as possible, not only to expand my network, but, you know, also to enlist help. And now all of a sudden, instead of you yourself in an emergency, now you've got Tom and you have Brian, you know, and you have Susan, who's a, an ER nurse. And all of a sudden you start building your network out like that. And it's not really a prepper group. It's not really a mutual aid group either. It's just a network. And you can kind of build a de facto preparedness group out of that once you start networking people. And networking with people. And so really, that I think that's one of the most important parts of your area study right now is looking for individuals in your area that you can meet and develop and you know enlist them into a preparedness group or a preparedness network. Uh, yeah, y, YT Watcher says, sounds like you've been reading Paul Stanilan's works. Yeah, actually, Networks of Rebellion by Paul Stanilan is a fantastic book and yeah that's the vertical ties and horizontal ties that's that's directly from stana land uh networks of rebellion i also have in in fox company right now if you want to join you know it's it is a membership so you do have to pay money to be in there but i actually have a uh, a chapter by chapter breakdown of that book and i go pretty heavily i, I break that down into, into kind of common sense terms they're chapter summaries basically so i've read the chapter highlighted all the parts that i think are important and then gone back in and typed up notes based on these things and kind of try to explain this so that you can get the gist of a book. You can get the the kind of the details of the book instead of reading like 10 hours, you know, you can read, you know, five or 10, you know, five minutes a chapter roughly and, and understand those concepts. Um, can you define an affinity group? I think I know what it means, but would like to be certain. Yeah. So, the affinity group is a big part of the security culture of these leftist groups. And basically they say, look, affinity groups are, you know, people, they're local people. They're people who know each other. They've known each other for a, a long time. And it's basically just a very tight knit group of individuals. That's very difficult to infiltrate. You know, if, if I've known these three or four other people for five or 10 years, there's a pretty good chance that, that these people are, are who they say they are. And uh, so that's kind of the con the whole concept of an affinity group, just very basically.
All right. Uh, I'll take another couple questions here. Daniel says, hello, I'm new to the channel. I'm liking it so far. Daniel, glad you're here. Um, by the way, if you haven't liked this, if you if you want to help me out, and I'll also help out our broader emergency preparedness community, uh, like this video because it's going to help it raise in search results and help propagate this live stream. Uh, and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because I do one of these every day. And eventually, like I said, we'll do we'll do better production value on this as well. Uh, Papa Smurf says, I did part of my area study and found it an offender a couple houses down when I talked to him. And it was a situation where, oh yeah, he was 18 and girlfriend was 17. And they're married and they have kids now. Yeah, and you know, by looking at sex offenders, I think that's a very good, a very important part of doing your area studies, looking at, at them, at sex offenders in your area. But yeah, they're not all equal, right? Um, you know, you may have some, like one guy, uh, ur it was urinated like within view of a public school and he got arrested for indecent exposure and now he's a sex offender for life. So not exactly a sex offender, but also something incredibly stupid to do. Um, <laughs> what about women in the network? Can they join? I guess they're of little use. That's, I mean, that's an absurd thing to say. Of course they can join. I want them to join. If they have a skill, you know, there are lots of good places where women can fit in. All right. I'm not, not everyone is a, as a gunfighter and that even applies, you know, for men and stuff. So, I mean, can women join? Of course. Like I want, if they have, if they have a skill, even if they don't have a skill, join and learn a skill, you know, figure out how you can plug in to the, to the greater effort. And, you know, I, I look at the army, right. And there's combat arms and then there's two support classes. There's, there's combat support and combat service support. And I'm not talking about combat in our emergency preparedness, but I'm just saying, look, man, it takes cooks and it takes supply and logistics and it takes medics and it takes Intel and communications and all sorts of other skills and MOSs to keep that machine running. And so, yeah, we need, we need all that kind of stuff in our preparedness groups as well. Uh, Cause it's kind of hard if you're out in the field doing search and rescue rescuing, you know, single mothers and their kids off of the roofs of homes. It's kind of difficult to like, stop. Okay. It's lunchtime, cook lunch. And, oh, we need to get some more water. And, oh, by the way, we need more of these supplies. Like, no, you want supply guys and you want cooks and, you know, you want all those people who are facilitating those kinds of operations. And the more support people you have, the higher op tempo you can run, the higher operational tempo you can have. So it takes a lot. It takes a village is what I'm trying to say. All right, let's see. Here, we'll do one more question. Man, we've almost done this for an hour. Uh, how do you gauge a neighbor as friend or foe? I don't talk to them. Um, you're just going to, like, man, I looked out the window first. When I first moved here, you know, I would look out the window. If I heard a, a car door slam or, you know, or someone, you know, pull, pull down the street or whatever, I'd look out the window and see. And if it was my neighbor... You know, I'd, I'd get up and run outside. Now it's easy for me because I work from home. I mostly work from home. Um, so you just got to engage these people. Go introduce yourself, and you know, see if they're open or if they're closed off. Um, you know, asking opinions is a very good way not to be intrusive, but you know, you could say, "Oh, you know, I was looking up the crime statistics for this area, and I noticed there's a lot of property crime. You know, have you heard anything about that?" And see what they say. See how oblivious or how turned on they are. And, you know, a lot of times people like talking about themselves. So even if you just say, Oh, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so, you know, it's like, you know, there, I don't know that it's appropriate for every, every situation, but you know, there's those icebreaker questions. Once you've developed some rapport, you know, you can say, Hey, you know, let me ask you a question. What's your take on this? Or I don't know. <laughs> Back when, like when I was in college, I, I, paid attention to all these stupid little dating things. And, uh, and, you know, basically this guy was talking about how to approach women in a bar and it's completely fabricated, but you know, 
it's it was basically social engineering before it was social engineering. And he would say, you know, you'd go up to them and say, oh, hey, you know, hi, I'm so and so. My friend and I were having an argument, and you know, would you weigh in and and tell us what you think so we can figure out who's right or whatever? And I mean, I'm not saying that that'll work in every scenario, you know, but uh, but think of think of ways that you can ask your neighbors questions without being intrusive. And a lot of times that they're called non-pertinent questions, right? Non-pertinent questions are used to build rapport or to kind of, uh, you know, hide, maybe hide, maybe your true collection intentions, your, your true collection targets. So, you know, just build, get out and build rapport pe- with people, man, just meet them and talk to them and see what they're about. And there's a pretty good chance that they're going to tell you what you need to know, especially if you build rapport with them. All right, NC says, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much. Glad, Very happy. Glad to do this. All right. Uh, let's see here. View at your own risk because if I could get a master class, 65 year old disabled ham with 50 years experience as my combo guy, I'd happily make sure they had the support they needed in order to obtain that person. Absolutely. Skills matter. Knowledge weighs nothing. And if you have people who are interested, they're like minded, they're motivated. And if we can look as an, as an NCO, right? Your my job or you know any NCO's job is to provide purpose, direction, and motivation for uh, for junior enlisted or for um, your soldiers, your troops. So purpose, like give them a skill or say, hey, if they come to the preparedness group, they're like, hey, I'm interested in preparedness. I'm concerned about the future, but I don't have any skills. Okay, great. Uh, what are you interested in? What are your hobbies? Let's find. Actually, my very first deployment. Um, uh, the like the f- first or second day I got into country to Afghanistan, and I went and met. We all went and met with the sergeant major, and the sergeant major asked us about ourselves. You know, he reviewed our packets and stuff, and he's trying to put people, he's trying to put the intelligence people where they needed to go. You know, in terms of their abilities, and that was my first major lesson in the army. That you know, people have they have natural skill sets or they have natural interests. They have things that are going to keep. They're going to have interests that keep them motivated in whatever they're doing. So provide people purpose, direction, and motivation, and they will likely do what needs to be done, especially if you give them a goal or give them a specific task. And if they understand where they fit in this organization, right? If you have a guy and you say, you know, hey, can you can you cook breakfast for the team? Let's just say that we're it's a hurricane, the power's out, and you know, we're we're boating around our neighborhood or canoeing around or walking through the water, traipsing through the water in our neighborhood, going door to door to check on people, right? And you say, okay, Brian, I know cooking is not the most glamorous thing, but we have a search and rescue team that needs to eat. And it would be great if while they're out there looking for people or going door to door and doing welfare checks for the neighborhood, if they could come back and have food prepared for them, right? And so you that's an obvious need. And so Brian, he might say, I'm not super enthused about cooking, but I understand that it needs to happen and somebody's got to do it. And so Brian's probably going to do it, even if he's not entirely happy about it. So if you can give people kind of a purpose and help them to understand what role they play in that organization or what role they play in that mission, then you are going to be much better off for it as a result. All right. We have just gone over an hour. Thanks for being here. I appreciate all the support. And I'll be back tomorrow morning. I'll try to do this around 10 a.m. or so uh, tomorrow morning, Thursday. Tomorrow's report is the economic early warning. So tomorrow I'll be talking about more uh, economic stuff. Um, And I will see you then. So until next time, be well and stay out front out here.